Welcome to Sirius Jibber Jabber. I'm here with my friend Jack White, whose phenomenal solo album Blunderbuss is his first number one record. It's been nominated for three Grammy Awards. Jack, nice to have you here. Nice, nice to have me here. Yeah, it's very good to be seen with you and to have you in this strange chamber. <laughs> I like this chamber you've built. <laughs> yeah, isn't you this built this yourself too. I did, I was up. Yeah. It took me four days to build this. <laughs> it's made of pure asbestos. Um, you'll be dead in a year. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. If you me. can even call this a show. I was thinking about today, I got a lot of people that asked me this about the time we met and I thought it was probably a good place to start. Yeah, uh, the beginning. The beginning, I was, all I remember is, I think it's the late 90s, I fly to Detroit to shoot a crazy video with Ted Nugent, I think, at his farm, <laughs> where we shot guns and rode around on three-wheeled vehicles. <laughs> and then at the end of the shoot, I come back to the hotel and we all go play. Uh, we, we, we see a bowling alley. Yeah. We go bowling, and that's where you and Meg came over. And how long yeah. had the White Stripes been around at that point? We were just probably just starting at that point. I mean, we were just kind of fumbling around. It was uh, a thought that, wow, this, this really, this band could really work. And I don't think really Meg was convinced at the, at the moment because it was so simple. It was the sort of thing you might think, oh, people might think this is foolish or something. But we were trying to be childish on purpose. So I think we were just sort of kicking around at the beginning then. Kicking around and yeah. you're in Detroit. Yeah. And you had been an upholsterer. Yes. And you take upholstering very seriously. I, was, yeah. I apologize because you offered to upholster the chair for the Conan show, this show. That offer still stands. And I didn't take you seriously. I didn't. I <laughs> thought you were kidding. No, I mean it. And I then mean, later I on, I found it. out you were serious. I'll do it. I'll still do it. All right. Let's do. A new, or we can do a whole new chair. All right. Upholster my chair for me. I like that. <laughs> I'll do it. Um, what about upholstering has helped you in your musical career? The most important part about it was there was a moment when I was a, a, an apprentice upholsterer. How old were you at the time? I was about 15, I think, 15 or 16. And there was a, it was a mid-century modern couch, sort of like a Vladimir Kagan piece, I think. I know I had pink fabric with silver threads in it, and I, it was tempted in, in the back. It was three staples in the back, just to keep it in place while the uh, upholsterer was working on the front of it. And I just kept staring at this over and over again. I was cleaning up, sweeping up, and then I went working on it, and I just kept staring at it. That's the minimum amount of staples to hold that piece of fabric down. That's, now we can call that upholstered. You know, what would be the minimum? You couldn't do it with two. You couldn't do it on the ends. The middle would be, right. you know, I just thought in my brain, this is the middle. A table can only, it can have three legs and still stand, but two, it'll fall. So that sort of image has been burned into my brain. I think about that probably once a week, that image of that, those three staples, and it's affected everything. I, I, I forced myself to do anything that I create, artistically and music-wise, whatever it is, I, I force it through the funnel of that idea, you know, and um, it, it, I have three lines or three concepts in a song, or I wrap it around storytelling, and melody, and rhythm. The White Stripes, the whole band was based on the number three. Yeah. So it's really about, it's about simplicity and not it's almost like a, uh, it's almost like a concept of minimalism, right? Would yeah. you say in some way, like, not anything more than you absolutely need? Well, you have to be careful when you do things like that because there's, a, there's this element of pretension that I think other people, uh, uh, there's two ways about it. One way was this, it can be pretentious if you take it too seriously, if you become, whatever, pedantic about it. But I looked at it as a way of limiting myself so that I could create more things, create more songs, because I'm so boxed in. My brain is forced to work with the tools that are at hand. I, 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 I can't uh, let some engineers fix it or let the three other members in the band cover it up with what they're playing or whatever. I am in this box by myself, or me and Meg are in this box. So I'm, we have to work. And I still do this no matter what I do. I mean, if I have a song, you know, there's seven, people backing me up or something, I'm still thinking about that for myself, where, where my head lays in the music or in the piece to keep myself boxed in. Anytime I give myself free reign all the time, all the money, whatever, uh, everything in, in front of me, I, I, it is not good for me. It, it, it makes me disinterested. I remember I was, uh, people ask me, like, when, do you, when do you write songs? I, didn't, I don't, I write songs when there's a task to do, when there's a job to do. We have a studio time booked tomorrow. And, you know, now what I do uh, is 
when I have my own studio, so I, I'll, I'll have people coming, like, you know, maybe next week I'll have the Peacocks, the gals that we be coming to record. So the night before, I maybe I will force myself to write songs because they're coming tomorrow. I have no choice. I have nothing for them to record. I have to write songs now. If I had said, well, I'll write some songs, and when I'm done with them, I'll call you guys and show up, it won't happen. It just, it just won't There's happen. There's a famous saying uh, that Samuel Johnson wrote the dictionary because he needed to pay his rent. <laughs> Right. He had to, uh, it was, the rent's due in a week, and he'd be like, all right, I'll give you a dictionary. <laughs> and um, there is something to that. Comfort kills, can kill an artistic impulse. You have to, um, I mean, yeah, what, 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 what good can come from comfort? I mean, it's not going to be art, you know? I mean, I, I think uh, there's, a, there's a false ideal out there to some people, maybe... In younger people, they might think, you know, I could be an artist and I don't have to work. And, uh, but I think like, calling yourself an artist, you, you have to work three times as hard as someone with a punch clock job. Because if you punch in, you have a responsibility at your job, but you have to, you can also do what you're told and, and, and work the machine, whatever you're doing and do what's there already there for you and do what you're told and do what's expected of you of that job. But if you're an artist and you have to create something from nothing, you know, there's nothing on this canvas, there's nothing on this tape, we have to create something that didn't exist before. I mean, that's, that's ultra responsibility, super responsibility, isn't it? So here's the question. It's not 1998 anymore. You're not in Detroit facing a choice between making it in music or upholstering for the rest of your life. You're now at a stage where you could be seen as comfortable, mm -hmm. how do you create the situation where you're not comfortable? How do now, you create the situation yeah. where you are up against it? Now it's really up to me, and it's really up to me to, to push myself and be harder on myself. It's not up to me now to say, oh, you know, I'm gonna record on Pro Tools, I'm gonna let someone else fix it. If there's mistakes on it, go I fix it with a mouse and, and use some program to tune it or whatever. I've really got to push myself to not take it easy and not take any kind of creature comforts of that scenario. Especially now, you know, it was, being in the White Stripes, half the, half the trouble was already there. There was only me and Meg. There was so little, a little amount of components involved. Half the work was done to keep it simple. But now, um, uh, if you know, if I, have a band, I have two bands now on tour with me now, so keeping my brain in that box is a, a lot more work, which I, I like that. It's, it's not, uh, you know, that's a far cry from having writer's block or not knowing what to do with myself. I, I, I know there's a lot of work on the table for me to do whenever I feel like it. And I always feel like it because I want to, I want to create something every day. Every right. day when I wake up, that's what I want to do. It's not busy work. It's not it's anal retentive behavior. And it's, I, I cannot wait to catch up to this idea I had three weeks ago that I haven't gotten to do yet. And... I, got, I do say, I will say the selfish part of it is that in music you can do that. And uh, like in film, if you're an actor or a director, you, you're at the mercy of bigger teams, you know, studio paying for it, right. make it set it up, scheduling and all that. I can go out and record in the studio and if it doesn't turn out well, I don't have to put it out and I, I can throw it away and start over again. So there is a selfishness to that world where I can, I can create every day because I, I want to and I don't have to answer to anybody. And I don't, I don't take that lightly, I take that. I respect that. Is there anything about this? Because you grew up very Catholic. I mean, uh, very, very Catholic. Yeah. Very Catholic family, big family. And there is, sometimes I sense, and maybe it's- that, A little bit of guilt? No, I'm just kidding. You know, what, you know what it is? It's a, you gotta work for it. Mm -hmm. It's that feeling that you always need to earn it. You always oh, yeah. need to, and that yeah. it is ingrained in Catholicism that, that you, I don't know, you dismiss praise. It's just uh -huh. stuff that in, gets in your bone marrow. Yeah. People say, congratulations, thanks, let's put that aside, yeah. we gotta get to work. Yeah. And, that, and that that's always yeah. the sense. Do you feel like that's something that probably got into your DNA a little bit? I, I guess we have a job, you know, if, you, if you're raised in any kind of faith or beliefs or even political beliefs, you know, it, you get to a point when you're an adult and you have to assess how much of that you want to let still exist in your brain and, and, and dictate how you live your life. And religion is the toughest of all of those because <clears throat> if you really have uh, questions that 
reach outside the bounds of the religion you were raised in, you, you've really got problems, you know. And, and, uh, but as we're, or you're talking about, like, the things on the side of it, like saying just even from being a big Catholic family, if you have that many people in the house or that many people older than you, you've got to determine, what, as you're older, what, what of those guilt trips that you were given or, or those lessons you were taught and, and anything that you learned that was beautiful or, or terrible, which of it do you listen to? Which of it do you keep going in your life? What do I do with my kids now when I, um, I'm trying to teach them something? And, uh, and I'll catch myself doing, you know, giving my kid a guilt trip or something. It's, it's an ultra-Catholic way of, of you know, raising somebody. And, and sometimes I'm like, you know, it's a good thing, though. I mean, that actually works, or because there's times where it actually it makes sense, you know? I, don't, I didn't dismiss it completely, 100%. That it's never useful. Well, it's funny, because it's there for a reason. Mm -hmm. There was a reason that, uh, that some of these rules were put in place. I think it's very mid-late 20th century to debunk it all. Yeah. And then you think, actually, uh, the thing that I'm happiest for, that I think I got maybe f from my parents, maybe from... Catholicism or whichever way that I was raised or being from a large family as I got this idea, this work ethic. Mm -hmm. I like to work really hard yeah, yeah. and I believe in hard work and I think that's the hardest thing. I believe in talent. Yeah, yeah. And clearly you're someone who's got talent, but I think talent is overrated. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I think talent's important, but the real accelerant, the real coefficient that's the mystery number that makes the whole thing work is hard, hard yeah. freaking work. Any of, uh, pop, any of your idols, I'm, I'm guessing, and, and any of my idols, and when you look back and you, and you see the things they've done, the footage and the recordings or the writings or whatever it is, you'll see these people hard at work. And even if they have things where they have an obsession or they have some kind of mental problem or whatever, what's happening is them working consistently and over and over again. And we were talking about Johnny Carson earlier yeah. today. I mean, yeah, nobody, yeah. he was so well read. He read every book. I yeah. mean, how do you have time to read that many books with a busy schedule as you have, you know? Uh, and because you're, you're just obsessed with pushing yourself, pushing yourself forward. I'm reading uh, Steve Martin's autobiography mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And uh, there's this thing been going on lately and it's, uh, you know, playing live shows around the world. And, there's this thing going on with audiences now, and it, it's it happening in Australia, in Europe, in America, and th these crowds are just like finishing songs and nobody's clapping. It's it's very strange. It's sort of like, well, you know, what's going on here? And, and I don't use a set list, and I'm I'm very off the cuff on stage. So I'm I've always felt about myself that I'm I'm like a stand-up comedian on stage. I I treat the scenario exactly like they do. Every time I hear a stand-up comedian talk about his craft, what he's doing. Like, oh, that comedian was ripping off my jokes and they were taking my material, or I did this joke and it bombed, I took it out of the set, the next joke I told, murdered. I like, that's exactly how I play music on stage. You know, and if the song, if, I, if no one claps, like if they're too cool to clap, like say if you're in a scenario where like some hipster thing where they're like too cool to clap, you know, like, yeah, they love the show, but they're, they're not gonna, you know. They're lying to me, do you know what I mean? Like a comedian, if he tells a great joke, I, it's be, people aren't like too cool to like, laugh. you can't help yourself, you laugh. You right. know? So, but people can decide if they want to clap or not. And so if they're lying to me, like they, they like this song, but they didn't clap for it, I have no idea what to do with the next song. I don't know what my next move is. A comedian knows what his next move is immediately, you know. Well, you think, I think they don't understand that, 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 you're, that you need them. They, you, exactly. And the thing That's, is, yes, yes. You, if people go and see Jack White, they're in control. They're they the have, but control. they don't know that. They have yeah. no idea that you're getting mm -hmm. anything I from them. I hand out them. pamphlets before every show. I've, I've gotten those pamphlets. <laughs> please, <laughs> please enjoy me. That. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's and really the saddest pamphlet <laughs> I've ever read before a, a, a rock show. Um, but I, I tell you, I was reading the Steve Martin biography, the autobiography, and, uh, and I think in the foreword he says, the, on stage when I was a stand-up comedian, there was no time for enjoyment. There's no time to enjoy myself. I'm too busy thinking about the next move. And I think that's exactly how I feel all the time. I never on stage sit and I'm like, yes, this is great. And I feel the whole song for the whole time. I'm loving this. And uh, the minute like I pass three seconds of that feeling, I, 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 it just, just starts to dissipate and, and disappear from me. I have to like shake it off and push forward and move forward. Even if the song is fraught with mistakes or problems, if I know in my brain I'm pushing forward and not sitting there laughing and having a blast, I know I'm getting somewhere, somehow, somewhere. Well, there's, uh, you know, I think about the way, the instruments you choose. You go out of your way to play instruments that are hard to play, yeah, yeah. that are hard to keep in tune, yeah. uh, 
Have you ever wanted to give in and say, I just want to go get myself a killer, amazing <laughs> Collings that just plays like yeah, butter? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, the temptation comes up all the time, and it's, it's a tough... Uh, it's a tough thing to, to know and see your peers doing those things, and, and nobody cares. The musicians don't really care that much, and the crowd definitely doesn't really even notice or know what's going on. But I know, you know, and that becomes a big question about art. If you do something that's important and extremely uh, involved in, in pushing yourself and, and making something beautiful happen, but no one will know it, should you do it or should you cheat? because no one will know that you're cheating either. It's a tough decision you have to be, be hard on yourself to really make, and um, I do that all the time. And sometimes, yeah, like, I mean, you know, I, I tell people about it almost, because maybe sometimes I feel like, you know, it's, it's, if I'm gonna go through all this trouble, I, mean, I, I, I kind of want people to know that how, right. how, how much trouble I'm going through. It's, it's kind of stupid, though, but almost like it, it becomes a different battle here. But, I, but you want to say this is a plastic guitar <laughs> from the Sears and Roebuck catalog or whatever yeah, in yeah. 1965, and mm. the strings are four inches from the fretboard, <laughs> and uh, it is a monster bitch to play. Yeah. And uh, but that is you like the struggle. Yeah. You like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I heard. I think it was in your documentary, Great White North. We talk about you. Mm. The great rock cliche or visual cliche is all the picks yeah. taped to the stands that you can just grab one. If right the pick there, breaks yeah. or you lose it, you just grab another yeah. one. You keep the picks back so that you literally have to yeah. walk back and get another pick. And yeah. when I heard you say that, I thought, that seems Catholic to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, that, well, you yeah. flagellation. You just, why don't you just, in between <laughs> chords, flagellate yourself <laughs> on the back and then a few more. But that's the sense I got. It is, man. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I, I know it feels, uh, 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 I'm, I'm feels like I'm getting somewhere. I, I know that was a tough move to do. I was watching uh, with my daughter, she's like six, six years old, Scarlett, uh, the other day, and uh, she's starting to get into W.C. Fields now. Mm -hmm. And we're watching she's this. She's probably my, one of my favorites. Really? Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe, maybe my favorite next to, it's like Marx Brothers, W.C. Fields, but yeah. W.C. Fields, fantastic. Yeah. Well, showed that that one with the Carl Lafong, you know, that, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in the bed, and then she's explaining why why does he keep saying Carl Lafong and spelling the whole thing out? And mm -hmm. I say it's funny that you know he's making such a big deal to spell this name out and talk about this damn name over and over again. Yeah, you know, and you know, trying to you know, at the age of six, just implanting this idea in your brain that there's in, in her brain that uh, uh, that you know there's seeds to things in the future. She'll understand that that. Uh, why I think how things are constructed, but you know she was she was watching this one where he's doing juggling. You know he, he did a routine where he's juggling uh, cigar boxes. Right. You know taking the middle one, and flipping it, and and I flashed back for a second. And my dad showed me that when I was a kid too, and we were watching and he was laughing and at the end he just looked over at me and said, "Try it sometime." You wow. Know? And uh, I thought. He's right, it looks really easy, but that took a lot of work and that took a lot of determination to care enough to think that, I mean, you gotta hand it to those guys, jugglers, street performers, I mean, those guys work really hard at what they're doing and they're accomplishing something. Because this was, here's the deal is, and all the books and all the movies and documentaries and all that stuff that are made about these people that we are interested in or that we think that accomplish something amazing, you know, who wants to hear that they took the easy way out? Right. Who wants to hear that they right. just they cheated? Nobody wants to hear that, you know. And, uh, and we were just talking about, you know, I told you I was watching these Larry Bird clips at like four in the morning a couple weeks ago for God knows whatever reason, but I, didn't, I just didn't know much about him. Um, and they, how, how hard on himself he was, you know, everyone else, you know, like I think Mikhail or something said on the team, uh, you know, at the end of the night, hey man, I go home. I got a life. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's going back out and he, he, popping three pointers uh, in the empty arena by himself. He would do it in the off season. Yeah. In the French Lick. He had a he had a hoop, yeah. and he would just shoot over and over <laughs> and over again in his spare time. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I'm just listening to the people you reference across the spectrum. You know, whether it's in music, whether it's in comedy, like a W. C. Fields or a Steve Martin, uh, Johnny Carson. There's a common thread, which is they all prepared. It's all preparation. Yeah. And I, you know, you can sound like an old man, but it's not fun to tell. I tell when young people ask me, I'd like to do what you're doing, or I'm interested in what you, how do I do that? It's not fun, but I have to tell them, you have to work really hard, yeah. and you always have to prepare. Yeah, yeah. And you have to have your shit together and really have it locked down. It's not a fun, and then go into a situation, and when you've done that, 
then that gives you the freedom to throw it out the window yeah, and play. Yeah, yeah. But it's not a fun message. And, and, there, and it's going to get worse because the technology that's available now is, is all about, as technology has always been, making things less labor intensive and, and removing the labor from, the, from this whatever thing it is, whatever idea it is. So as technology gets more and more down the line of you don't need to sing in tune, we can sing in tune for you, press this button and it will tune you. I mean, it's going to get worse and worse, and it's up to every, I have a big chip on my shoulder about responsibility for technology. You know, like when the telephone first came out, people learned telephone etiquette, you know, when people actually said, hoy. Ahoy. Ahoy, hoy. Yeah, hoy, hoy. Ahoy, hoy. You know, there was telephone etiquette. It was a politeness, a new kind of politeness, not just taking politeness from the parlor and put it onto this device. It was a new kind of politeness because you couldn't see the other person. And I think there were, for a long time, technology, uh, even Vitrolas, you know, how, to, uh, how that was done, there was a, a manners and politeness that were attached to it, responsibility for the new technology. But I think nowadays, I think the new technology is here, give me the toy, and I, you know, and I, I don't give a damn anything to do with anything rules. No rules about the toy at all, just give me the toy. Meaning, we're out to dinner right now, and I could spend the whole time with this Blackberry doing this, and I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh and not paying any attention to you. Right, the whole concept and, of going out to dinner and having a social, you know, it's when the restaurant was first invented. You, you think about that, you just imagine that restaurants always existed. Yeah. But apparently, restaurants, someone invented the idea of let's go out to eat and you can have dinner. I mean, mm -hmm. people had gone to taverns before, but a restaurant, and when people first went to restaurants, it was thought to be very rude to have yeah. other people seeing you eat. That right, was thought right. of as rude, something we don't think at all right. about anymore. But that was thought of as rude. Strangers yeah. shouldn't see you putting food in your mouth, so they had to separate people <laughs> and have them in people. behind curtains <laughs> and things <laughs> erode, things erode. And now, you know, can you imagine a McDonald's where there's curtains? They can get your <laughs> Big Mac and go behind a curtain. <laughs> but we don't see a... Uh, uh, we don't hear any talk at all about it, only like as, as jokes of people being rude with it, but whatever, that's just how things go nowadays. You're not gonna stop the monster, you know, the snowball of it rolling down. But it, 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 I, I'm a believer that new technology means new responsibility. In art forms too, if you are a photographer, I mean, you have Photoshop now. I mean, now if you're gonna call yourself a photographer and, and, and be one and, and dedicate your life to that, you have a big monster hanging out in front of you that can make you cheat on everything. Contrast, lighting, aperture, everything. You can cheat on everything. And it's your duty to decide how much you're gonna let yourself fall down that well because now if I show you a great photograph, it's beautiful, you know, whatever, 30, 40 years ago it was, who took that photo? How did that happen? How did he capture that moment? Right. And now it's, it's probably fake or it's probably, altered to there's, look that good. probably an, an Ansel yeah. Adams app. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> You can just <laughs> take something with your iPhone and push it, and then it's just every bit as good. Uh, Some people will say, who cares? So what, the image is great, it's two-dimensional. Anyways, what does it matter how it was created? But to, to be a photographer and dedicate yourself to that, you have to really be able to live with yourself, that you know that um, just taking the easy way out like that through technology is, is not always fulfilling either. You, you mentioned image, and it's funny because it's a quote that you have in uh, a scene that really struck me in a uh, documentary, We May Go Through Canada, mm -hmm. and at one point you said one of your, the reviews that you liked the most, and you'll, you'll remember it better than I do, is mm -hmm. I think someone said, you know, the White Stripes are, are, are we're simultaneously the most real and most fake band in the yes, world. Yeah, most, yeah. And I think you said fake first, real second. Most mm -hmm. fake and most, and, and yeah. because of that, most real band in the world. And I mm -hmm. thought that is a fascinating mm -hmm. statement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously you've, you play with image, you play with how things look, it's very important to you. And yet mostly what we've talked about here for a long time mm -hmm. is stripping things of ornamentation yeah. when you actually do the work. Oh, we so it's this we, crazy oh, contrast. Yeah, yeah. I'd, love, I'd love to, to ex, you know, extrapolate, what do you call it? There's no extrapolating here. I'd love to explore. We, we don't have the equipment for extrapolating. <laughs> it's very expensive. It's like spelunking. Yeah. That is a, a beautiful point of uh, how, when we started the White Stripes, for example, and I still do it now, and we did when we were on your show the other day, you know, there's, for me, the easy way out is to go up in jeans and a t-shirt. And, and 
But what's, what comes along with that is a, a, a generation for the last, you know, 20, 30, or however years since punk, that that type of dress was considered real. You were real. Yep. You weren't the, the, you know, soul review. You weren't the, you know, the Beatles dressed up on Ed Sullivan or whatever. You were real because you were in jeans and a t-shirt. And that choice was also the same choice that tons of other people are making. They're all making that choice when they walk out on stage. You're making, you have to make a choice. You can go in what you slept in last night or you can dress up in a suit or something like that. But the idea that that became authenticity, that that gives you a license of authenticity, always bugged me. And when Meg and I were starting and we were playing blues music, and I, you know, this is the music that was closest to our hearts, and I started rapping around these other ideas, uh, and I thought, you know, the best way to show how real this is, this music is, is to give them an artifice, a presentation that's all, the aesthetic is all red, white, and black. And it's presented to them that if someone went walk into that bar and say, this is bullshit, look at this. Oh, this is a real blues band? The brother and sister, she's in pigtails, she got peppermint's paint on everything. I mean, this is whatever. Right. But those are the same people you, I don't want to connect with. I don't want to share with them because they can't see past that. And that's like the ultimate test. You know, if you couldn't see past that and realize that this music is actually ultra real and full of mistakes, messed up, you know, and at least attempting to try to get down to something dirty, you know. And I, 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 don't, I, don't, want, I'm, I don't want to use the word authentic because I think authenticity is a, a trap. You know, I think, I, think it, it, I think it's a waste of time, everybody's time. And uh, authenticity in, in music has been something that everyone's chased you know, for a long time. There's these different periods of music, you know, where, you know, the big band periods or even acoustic music periods into big band periods, country music, ultra produced things, now computerized music, digital music, where, you know, people have all said, yeah, but that's not the real deal. You, I like this person, yeah, but he's not the real deal. This guy's the real deal. And you have to decide for yourself what, what that means, you know? Well, I mean, it's like, you know, in whatever, in 19, I'm gonna say 68, 69, in music, Everything's gotten psychedelic. Everything yeah. started to, and then the band comes along, yeah. and everyone decides now we've got to all, you know, get back to what's real. Yeah. But yeah. people, but then people realize things drift again, and who's to say what's real? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there are, everyone's trying to get back to what they think is the real roots music. What music? What music is your favorite music? To, what type? What genre? What kind of? You know what, it's funny, because I... I always imagine that it's Rockabilly is your favorite music. Rockabilly, I don't know if ro yeah, Rockabilly was what grabbed me completely. I don't come from a musical family at mm -hmm. all, and I wasn't a particularly... Uh, I was really interested in music, but resisted anyone trying to teach me anything. And then mm -hmm. I was in college, and I'm going to this Ivy League college, and I'm... Um, and I'm it hit me. I uh, Sun Session, Elvis Presley got re-released, yeah. which, and then I was started listening to Jerry Lee Lewis. I got the the poster in my room in college was the Jerry Lee Lewis on the flatbed from High School Confidential, um, and I got hit hard. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but just started uh, singing it. I had been a bad drummer, like a pretty mediocre drummer, but I was yeah. passionate about drumming. I had a really crappy set. I bought the cheapest set I could get because I didn't have a lot of money. I got a Courtly. And yeah. I've asked people all over the world, have you ever heard of a Courtly? No one's heard of it. Yeah. But I still have it. It's a, they made like three of them and then said, we're not a drum company. Right, yeah, Started yeah. meeting radiators or something. But, and then I, uh, when I got out to LA, it was just in me. And I went and got a $90 guitar at Freedom Guitar and uh, um, got the Mel Bay chord book. Nice. And. <laughs> just sat there for a long time. And when I was a young comedy writer and single and had no girlfriend, I just used to go home mm -hmm. every night from whatever show I was working on. Yeah. And I would sit there with the TV on and for six hours straight um, teach myself chords. But what really grabbed me was rockabilly. And it's so visceral yeah. and just like tra the original train kept a rolling. Yeah. It was just, it's borderline unpleasant. Yeah. That's what I. Yes, but, yeah. but I'm. I've always been. Uh, I don't know. It's there was some kind of intensity to it. Yeah. And uh, I wish. And I never really got much beyond that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I always try to get more sophisticated about my playing, and it always just snaps back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I have my 
my real outlet. I mean, the thing that you do finds you more than you find it. Um, I, see, I, loved, I loved that very much. And I was in high school, I, I got into surf music and rockabilly music. And I was going to see any of those kind of bands that I could. And the, after a while, a little bit of me started to lose the uh, attention for, um, you know, the, the, the stylistic people who are trying to be like retro and recreate a moment in time. It's gone. And dress that way. Yeah, yeah it's like, it's kind of nice for a party or a Halloween or something like that, but to dedicate your lifestyle to this one moment in American right. culture history, right. this one year, it's, it's nifty in one way, but another way I thought, well, it's a dead end. I mean, you can't explore that music in a bigger way as a songwriter. You know, as I, got, I got to listen to Gene Vincent to this day, and I'll listen to the day I die. I love him. Yeah. Um, and I, I play his music, and I've covered his songs and stuff like that. And, uh, but uh, Isn't if I, everything in E, with yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think everything is in E. That's what I liked. Is E's yeah. great. Yeah. And uh, but he uh, and he had one of the great guitar players. Oh yeah, uh, Cliff Gallup. Cliff Gallup. Uh, you, it's funny because you always talk about how your maybe your favorite song is by Sunhouse. Yeah, grin in your face. Grin and in your face. I was always surprised by that because I appreciate it, but it's almost like that was your a, a religious light that hit you when you yeah. heard yeah. grin in your face. But Sunhouse, yeah. when you listen to it, it's so primal. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Yeah, hand claps. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the message that's in it, too, besides how it was recorded and, and how it sounded from him and how his hand claps are off time, even with his thing. There's no music behind it. Uh, it's several things at once. It's blues. It's like a, a work song. It's a religious song. It's a, it's a song that's from one person against the world, one person against his own friends and family, which is sort of the, you know, a, ba you know, a hallmark of the blues. You know? But uh, I think even the message... More so, but it's probably something that has always bugged me when I, since I was a kid and probably will always bug me later on is how much do you care what other people think? I mean, like the comedian on stage, you tell the joke and nobody laughs. Um, you have to take another step, a new step. You can cower and fall down and die from it. You can, you can let it affect you that way or you can let it push you to do something new and move forward to something positive, which... I think God has also cursed us that we can't really enjoy the good moment too after that yeah. at times, which is a shame. But the I, idea, I, I, you know, what I've learned is I'm very good at hating the bad moment mm -hmm. and terrible at enjoying the good moment. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, can have nine good yeah, moments yeah. in a row <laughs> and then I have the bad moment and I savor it. I yeah. like ladle myself. Like it's like I'm, yeah. it's gravy and I'm yeah. poor and I spend a long time yeah. making everyone around me suffer and I suffer. <laughs> and, and then they say like, you just had nine great shows. Why are you focusing on this yeah. one? And I think, I don't know, because it feels good to hate myself. I don't know. <laughs> it's not fair though. I mean, it's also like when you, there was something good does happen and you try to enjoy it in a way if you enjoy it too much, you, you fall into traps of being egotistical or something like that, or, or people around you just being turned off by your own love of something good that happened to you. And so there's this extremely narrow window when you create things and make things that didn't exist that you have to live in, which is very hard to do because to, to create a balance, you know, to know that that wasn't, that wasn't working, that was in the bad world, that worked, that was in the good world. And how much you let other people around you, your friends and family, see of how much that affects you. What people thought of that, what people thought of that. And how it, all you can do is to let it push you forward and just take everything, like, even keel. Like, that was bad, that was good, that was bad, that was good. Well, and okay, so here's the trap. Because you've had a lot of critical acclaim. Yeah. You are... Yeah. At times, yeah. Well, I would say fairly mm -hmm. consistently, you know, I mean, you probably can search out the negative because that's the... But mm. from my point of view, you, more than most everybody I know in, in your field, has had a lot of musical... Has, a lot of, has had a great deal of critical acclaim. Mm. And then the danger becomes, I like it. Yeah, I yeah. like people liking me. Sure, and yeah, yeah, we've yeah. all been there. It's, yeah, it's yeah. really nice to be liked. And then when you do something that isn't so popular, it doesn't, you can tell yourself, mm -hmm. I need to endure mm -hmm. people not liking me to do the good work. Yeah. But it feels really good. And it's, a it dangerous, probably, it's a dangerous zone. Yeah. It's dangerous. I mean, and it, it's, it's not fair that it's dangerous. It should be climbing up the mountain and you're at the top of the mountain of whatever. And 
okay, you 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 did what it took. You didn't you didn't cheat and take a helicopter to the top of the mountain. You really climbed up the top of the mountain. But that when you get up there, it doesn't matter if you took the helicopter. It doesn't matter if you climbed and got all bloody from it. Um, the rewards up there are fleeting, and they they don't really have legs. They they're just they're fleeting, and they and, and you can't hold on to them. Right. Other people won't let you hold on to them. Really. Uh, I, I it's it's it's. I mean, try to do it. I mean, try to talk about yourself and a good thing that happened to you for more than ten seconds. I heard a really <laughs> I heard a really funny story about. Um, Arthur Miller, I don't know if it's true, but I think, let's pretend it's true. Okay. Because this is for the internet and it doesn't matter. Um, but I think Arthur Miller once said that when he first wrote Death of a Salesman, everyone said, oh my God, you're a genius. Mm -hmm. You wrote Death of a Salesman. And then everything else he wrote, people said, it's good, but it's no Death of a right. Salesman. And then at the end of his career, they said, you know, Death of a Salesman wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I, I, if you're, I don't know. If the you're looking for that, ever written. what do you think is sadder story? A Death of a Salesman or Lord of the Flies? Mm, I gotta go with Lord of the. F I just have a real. Uh, when people taunt a heavy person, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. It, I, I can't watch a movie where a heavy person is taunted, yeah, and I don't know I why. I'm, How about the actors they hired to play the person? Oh, How does no, no, that audition no. go? That seems really awkward. I get like I I, I can't do it. I can't watch yeah. Gilbert Grape. I can't. Oh, I won't yeah, watch yeah. Gilbert Grape for that reason. Right, right, right. Um, Have you seen the movie, uh, the documentary, The Fog of War? Yes. Or Robert McNamara. Yep. Yeah. I'm entranced by it. I think I've watched it like six times now. What is it about The Fog of War that? I, someone just said you should check this out, and I, I, I turned it on and I said, "Oh, I don't even know. I never. I knew nothing about Robert McNamara, and I never see, even seen a picture of him. And I thought I know a pretty fair amount of U.S. Right. history and stuff, but I just didn't know anything about him, you know. Um, and then that he was president of Ford Motor Company, and then he became you know, Secretary of Defense. I think the idea at the time in Camelot was we can hire incredibly smart young people, and they'll solve all the world's problems. Y yeah. So yeah. when you think about I mean, you're from Detroit, so you understand. If you, if you think about an auto executive in 1960, how they were gods, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And so, and he was this brilliant guy. And so he comes into the Kennedy administration and they bring him in. You know, he, he continues. Lyndon Johnson begs everyone to stay, so he stays with Johnson and then he yeah. ends up running this war, which is a colossal mistake, and he eventually realizes that. And so it's, yeah, yeah that, that documentary is really poignant. Because he's it's brilliant, but he's also like a dad. It's almost like he took someone's dad on a 50s block and put him in these most powerful positions in the world. Yeah. I mean, he was so heavily involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which really, we came so close to the world ending at that point. And also Ford Motor Company and, and safety and, 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 and interdict introducing safety ideas to cars, which Tucker had tried to do but failed. And, and uh, it's these people like that that are so important to world history that not that many people even know their names or saw the picture like I didn't know his name. Or. So how did you get, I mean, what is it you're watching? Are you watching the History Channel? Like when you're trying to just yeah. relax, what are you watching? Uh, I, I really do enjoy documentaries. I could read an encyclopedia like, all day long. I, I, I prefer books that are about things that really happen. Yes. You know, you know I'm always, my wife uh, loves fiction. She's mm. very smart and she's constantly, and she's reading great fiction. My wife like is- Harry a, Potter and stuff. Well, the really good Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the uh, Sorcerer's Stone. Um, but she's, <laughs> the classics, you know, not this whatever, yeah. later stuff that I think really perverted Harry's nature. <laughs> but she, my wife is a, I, I think she's really brilliant and she's constantly reading like I'll, you know, I'll be getting ready for bed and she's in bed reading, she's reading Chekhov, you know, mm. she's reading this great stuff. And she'll be saying, you know, you should read this. And I'll say, you know what, I, life is too short and I want to know what happened. Mm. So I ex almost exclusively read you said, she history. Said that, you said that. Uh, you I said, said that. I said, I, I, I want to know what happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to know what yeah. happened. I want to know, yeah. uh, and, and so I'm constantly getting, you know, there's a picture of me someone took in the 90s where I finally went on a vacation and I'm sitting on the beach and, and it's like beautiful. It's like Anguilla or something. I'm sitting on the beach and I'm, of course, I'm 
wearing like 900 sunblock. But I'm sitting on the beach and it's beautiful and it's this color photograph and I'm reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. It's just this like giant swastika on it and it's this thick and I'm like, ah, vacation, you know. Um, I'm reading about, you know, the failed Russian offensive. What'd I just, you, I'm, I'm fascinated. Of, uh, what do you think of the Lincoln movie? I really love the Lincoln movie. And since this is a zone to be incredibly honest, I love the Lincoln movie. I thought it was fantastic. I love Daniel Day Lewis because he portrayed the real Lincoln, down to every single actor who's ever portrayed Lincoln has done him with this deep baritone. Four score. Yeah, Lincoln had a high pitched yeah. voice. And I thought he just made me love, uh, I love Lincoln, know way too much about Lincoln, and thought he was brilliant. Yeah. There were a couple things I, I wish the movie had ended. I don't know why they had to kill the Lincoln character off at the end. They didn't. Was, was that great. was the same thing. I thought there's a part in the movie where Lincoln says he's got to go to the theater, and he has this line. He says, well, gentlemen, I'd like to stay. No, he said, I have to go, though I'd like to stay. And then there's a long yeah, walk off. If the movie had ended there, I'd have cried for seven days. Uh, it was, it was, I didn't yeah. need to then, like, uh, we know what happened. Right. And I thought that would have been more beautiful. And I have calls into Spielberg and... He's not it, was <laughs> it was cool that they showed a, a, a performance in a theater and Lincoln's son to make you even think that that might have been America. Yeah, it was America, a nice, I mean, at least it didn't show a bloody, like, uh, like yeah, but, but, uh, but, but I, just, I, I agree with what you're saying. I yeah, thought okay. that would have been a nice way to end it, and I was literally in the lobby telling people that. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. why is Conan O'Brien... But, you know, the trailer threw me off. I thought that for, when I saw the Lincoln trailer, like, oh, man, I thought this was going to be great. And I saw the trailer and I just thought, damn it, it ain't. Like, it's too... It, like, they got all the components. They got the great costume designers or the set directors and all that stuff, and everything's there. But it, it's not going to be what I thought it was going to be. But the trailer was wrong. I, I went in and then, you know, 20 minutes, I thought, this is really good. This All right. Is really good. Well, this brings up a good area. You are an opinionated guy. You like having control, as do I. Is it hard for you to watch things and step back and enjoy them and experience them without editing them in your mind and moving them around? Mm. Like, you're, you know, you've seen a movie and yeah. you're thinking, no, that's not what I would do. Or you're listening to a band or you're... Yeah, what happens? Well, I know I like something when I don't notice how it was made. If, if you I, don't see the scenes. Yeah, if I hear a song and I don't like, oh, they turned reverb on on that part of the song, or they added a digital delay on his voice or something like that. Or they kind of borrowed that lick. Yeah, when I heard them, when I when I hear them, what their conversation was making it, I, I, it bugs me. Then I kind of I can't enjoy it so much. When it goes by, the scene goes by, or the painting, or the, the, the song goes by, and you don't notice anything about how it was made, then I think that's a really good a mark of something good. That's hard to get to that point, too. I mean, it's right. hard to create something like that. Let's talk about, if you don't mind, this. I went to Third Man Records and got to make a record with you, which yeah. is still one of my, the tour, and then that experience, one of my favorite experiences in my life that I'll always treasure, people later on asked me, what's it like at Third Man Records? And mm. I thought, oh, this is tough. And then I, I said, you know, Jack is in complete, I've never met anyone, and I mean this as a compliment, mm. who has completely invented his environment. You've, you've created an environment mm -hmm. out of whole cloth for yourself. Mm -hmm. And at first I was thinking, it's kind of like an Andy Warhol thing where you've created, mm. you know, the factory, mm -hmm. and you've created this aesthetic and this group of people and this look and mm -hmm. this tribal, you know, uh, happening. And then I thought, you know what? It's really a Batman villain. <laughs> like, you've, <laughs> you know, whenever you like, whether it's Mr. Freeze or the Riddler or the Joker, what I always loved about yeah. Batman, the TV, classic TV show, is he always got his people I, 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 to wear musical notes, yeah. or <laughs> the, the, the Riddler hired guys. He went and found common criminals, and he got them to wear turtlenecks that have a question mark on them. And he also got them to buy into the Riddler's aesthetic, mm. and it was be, it was beautiful. And I thought, like, there's, let's talk about that. Yeah, like yeah. that to me, that is a well, great achievement. It, well, thank you, and and I, I feel good. I feel proud that you're saying that to me because I I know that third man. It came the way a lot of a lot of times the way I, I make things, which is it, it's sort of there are these happy accidents. I stumble into it and I and it gets pushed in these baby steps and something in the end says, Oh wow, that thing exists now. And that building I bought was just a place to store my gear. I, I didn't have a I was renting all these storage units for all the tour gear when I come home from tour. I store all this drums and, and amps and stuff somewhere. 
I was like, it'd be nice to just have a building where it was all there and it was on racks and I could get that keyboard or that guitar and take it to the studio. Not buried away in some storage unit where you need a padlock and it's nighttime with a flashlight, so yeah, you yeah, get a yeah. keyboard. Yeah. You know, somewhere it's available. That's all I wanted to do with that building. And then I thought, well, you know what, it'd be nice. I got the White Stripes vinyl rights back. Uh, the, the years at the time period had, had been used up and now I can print them and they, they were out of print. So I don't like records being out of print. I think it's kind of ridiculous. I think records should always be in print if it was like, if Columbia Records put out some record by any artist, they should always have a stack of them on a shelf somewhere, even if there's 10 of them, you know, that right. you can get. So I thought, well, you know, I want to put the White Stripes old vinyl records in, in print and keep them in print forever. And I thought, hired a couple of these guys, the Benz, uh, to do that. So that was, it was going to be it. And I said, oh, you know, let's put a store in the front. There's a little room in the front. Let's put a little store there. And people can bit, ring the buzzer. Maybe once a week someone will come by and we'll, we'll come up and we'll sell them a 45. You know, that'll happen like once a week. You know, and then baby step. And then we, we had to put a photo studio in the back. So it'd be nice to be able to rehearse for tour here for lighting and monitors to put a stage there. And as you know, you ended up playing a live show at that mm -hmm. stage that became a live venue. And uh, now we have a lathe cutting studio behind that stage where we cut the, the, the shows direct to acetate, which is the only place in live venue in the world that's doing that. Uh, it goes directly to vinyl and the crowd can see through the window what, what's happening and they're, they're completely involved and they, they feel, they know what's happening. You're making a record here. It's almost like a TV show now making this live mm -hmm. record. So um, this is all just from a place I wanted to get my gear. So it was like letting things naturally happen, you know. But this feels like the story of your whole process. Because to go way back to... The caveman days. The caveman days, when you discovered fire <laughs> with your friend Og. <laughs> good, no, good guy. Yeah, good, really good guy. Really pity that you had to crush his skull with a handmade stone tool. No, what... what um, you know, I remember... I don't know if I read somewhere, you told me somewhere, when you were just starting out and you were playing with Meg, you were thinking, hey, if we could just get up on stage and play in front of people. Yeah. So that would be cool. Mm. And what happens is it's a constant upping of the ante. Yeah. yeah right. Which is, I, you know, if I could just get on stage mm -hmm. and play and yeah. we could get a few people to come see us, I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. If we could just have a couple more songs, if we could have a few more gigs, yeah, yeah. if we could make a record, if we could tour, mm -hmm. if we could, okay, now we've got one smash record, if we could have another one, yeah. if we could, you know, duh, Grammys, uh, if we could tour the world, if we could make a documentary, yeah. it's a never ending upping of it the ante. And now end, you're yeah. talking about, you know, if we could have a space where we're making the records, I mean, you've taken yeah. it to that extreme. Yeah, yeah. And it, a lot of musicians, though, though, you say a band, like, they will do that. Like, it would be great if we had a band. It would be great if we got on stage. What if we wrote our own songs? They get to that point, and I think at some point they say, yeah, you know, i got to go back to my day job, and we got to do that thing, and we'll play another gig next month, and then, you know. It's then gone. They, they, they lose the, either the ability or the desire to push themselves over and over and over and over again, and that's the right. only thing you can really do. You can also, you can get lucky, you could have some lucky break or something, and, and it catapults you to some level, and then you have some decisions to make up there, but in the natural way of things, if you, if you, you, you basically have moments where you can stop and say, like we said about Mikhail and Larry Bird, like, like, you know, hey, I have a life, man. I mean, you can say that at any moment, and say, hey, I, I like music, but, you know, I'm not gonna spend 24 hours a day thinking about it, but, you know. That that that's what comes from that. You know, if you, if there's no pushing, I think you know we were saying earlier about the, all the idols that we've had, the people we are interested in from the past. I think they all seem to be people who push and push and push. And uh, I, I can imagine even if you were had no talent or anything and no ability to bring anything to life, not funny, not what interesting or whatever. Even if you pushed yourself and worked constantly at it something would happen. I mean, how could it not? And something eventually would click. Yeah, no, I, I uh, you know. You'd at least find out where you're supposed to be, or what, what zone you're supposed to be in, you know. Maybe you know, I'm not supposed to be an actor, maybe I'm supposed to be a comedian, maybe I'm not supposed to be a musician, maybe I'm supposed to be a painter. At some point, something would click, I think, pushing yourself that much. Here's the good news and the bad news. I can look at a guy like David Letterman mm -hmm. and say, well, why isn't he happy? Because mm -hmm. he really achieved everything. Sure. But I know that there are, some people who are 20 years younger than me who are like, well, what's, you know, why would he be unhappy? Because mm. he, you know, and you think nobody feels that way. Mm. Nobody feels like they have, they're done. Nobody feels mm. like they're done. Uh, uh, nobody, right. I mean, it, there's, it's like a mixture of. You never arrive. I don't think you ever arrive. You never arrive. Mm. And also, I don't know, 
like I wanted to bring up, I don't know, anger or sometimes people say to me like, you seem like I can get cranky, I can get angry. Mm. And I say, yeah, I just think that's part of this spice mm. that keeps me going. Yeah. I, if I was completely contented, that would be it. But yeah, anger yeah, yeah. seems to, anger and frustration seems to be necessary components. I think the minute you don't have those. Yeah, if you eliminate all those other emotions, you're sort of like, I mean, it's sort of, in a way, it's sort of easy to be a nice guy and, and be like happy-go-lucky and say, hey, yeah, you know, and, but maybe that kind of attitude, it's harder for, to get things done and get things accomplished and get things to happen and push yourself if you don't allow all those other emotions to exist. I, I, I often think that society is missing out on something right now to think that anger and, and hostility are things that are in the violent realm of emotions, that they're all completely 100% bad and should be avoided at all costs. I don't think that's true at all. I mean, uh, uh, that those emotions are very much relevant in, say, blues music. They're, they're very much re uh, relevant in painting, you know, and rock and roll, punk rock, all of that. I mean, those are, if they had ignored those emotions and not thought about them and expressed them. They wouldn't have. Uh, they wouldn't have been able to uh, explore those ideas. And uh, again, I, almost happy-go-luckiness is sort of like I was saying, like on stage, you can be uh, like, oh, I'm enjoying this song. It feels great. This feels good. You know, this is a smile on my face. Um, this is a blast. Okay, that's kind of easy to do. That's sort of like having a party. You know, you can be like a, a heavy metal band and be partying and you know, all right. that. And and I don't know if that's art or music. It's it's just maybe something else. It needs another name. There's got to be something inside you that's churning it up. There has to be. Yeah. That's gotta be part of the creative process. It's their self-inflicted wounds, you know? I mean, you're, you're, that's the responsibility that comes with freedom, you know? Freedom of, to be an artist. That's a, that's a huge freedom, and, and at the same time, has to be a huge responsibility. Or there, nothing will be accomplished, and it's, and it's not fair to other people, you know? It's like the lazy so-and-so, whatever, who's just sitting around, and the other people, his roommates are keeping them alive and keep giving them shelter and all that stuff, you know, like you can get away with that for a minute, but uh, after a while, you know, everyone else is like, hey man, you know, we're not all here to just take care of you. You know, you have to take care of yourself. And um, the, the, I think those, those, those are really heightened a, 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 in, in the world of art and, and creativity. You, you, you have to think about all those things. I, I sometimes, I think too much ab about that, about, uh, the temptation is to take those easy ways out all the time because I see other people doing it. I think, oh, damn. I, I mean, even to show other people, I'll have another musician in my studio and say, we did this song and this is how we did it and this is the machine we did it on and these are the tools we did it with and have another musician look at it and say, mm, okay. Well, yeah, well, um, we, you know, we just recorded our album and we did it totally the easy way and we didn't record it on Pro Tools and I had these four engineers do it and they fixed everything on it and it's coming out next week. Oh, yeah. So like, there's a first thing I'm like, damn, man. I guess I could do that, and I could do that, and no one would even know. No one would even know I did it that way. And I could, dude, I can't, I can't do it. Well, I, can't, I hate to it. beat a dead horse, but I yeah, swear yeah. to God, there's like a religious, <laughs> quasi-Catholic component to, I would know. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel that way about comedy. You can, when you cheat, you know it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it feels horrible. And if then something just, good happens, you want it to be, it, it was created under circumstances you can be proud of. It, it's not, uh, you know, something that was like someone else did the work or a computer did the work or something like that. The photographer I was talking about earlier, if someone says, oh, that was an amazing photo you took, well, we photoshopped the whole thing. I mean, yeah. can you be proud of that? I, I, guess, I guess you can, but I, I, I wouldn't be proud of it. Um, you, I think more than anybody I can think of in music off the top of my head, you work so well with women, Meg, mm -hmm. uh, Allison, Mosshart, you mean current band, phenomenal. Judy These, Dench. Yeah, Dame Judy Dench, the music that you cut with her and that erotic film you made. You guys, what it, Why do I find women so attractive? Is that what you're trying to ask me? Yeah, because I don't get it. I like men. I like a ma a, 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 I always knew that. I like a naked male body. I sometimes the, the sunsets that we spend together in a parked car on top of a hill, I sometimes wonder if that's how you're... You mean when I try and hold your hand? Yeah. But then pretend I'm reaching for the gear shift? Yeah. I, some, I wonder. Um, I'm fine with Yeah, it. but you've... Uh, you... Working with women. You're so... You're, you're just... 
it, it comes so naturally to you. And I think it's, it, you, you don't, I don't see other musicians and artists making that connection as easily as you. I don't know if you've mm. ever given it any thought, like mm. how is it that I, I communicate so well with I, women? It's, a, it's an interesting question. In my, in my mind, like when asked cold, you know, I, I, it feels like I don't discriminate in any way, you know, age, race, gender at all. I just work with people that are, are, are cooking and they're making their, they're pushing themselves. You've never worked with a baby. I have not yet. Not you hate that. babies. I hate, I hate you're very, you're very. <laughs> they're so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, they're constantly, sh just, they shit themselves. <laughs> but that's my biggest complaint with you is your anti-babyism. Uh, <laughs> right, but you're, you're, so you're saying you're not thinking about it. Well, that's what I would add, that's the answer in my head that, that seems, Pretty clean uh, an answer, but then I know there's other things too. That when I am working with uh, women, I do feel that there's this sense of something's gone out the window. There's some. There's a lot of bullshit that's been thrown away, and now we're getting down to the real creativity and the real work. And maybe working with men, no matter how clean it's going on, there's always maybe some kind of competition or ego or other qualities in the room that you can't put your finger on, which everything has to be filtered through. So, for some reason, the females, like working with Loretta Lynn or, uh, you know, Alicia Keys or something like that. Wanda they, they, Jackson. Wanda Jackson. They, it seems like that just goes out the window, and we, we get down to the work faster. So I do, I definitely think there's, a, there's an appeal to it for me. And we become very equal very fast and on the same page very fast. Someone told me one time, like, it was some goofy thing. I, I'm not someone told me, it was a, something I read an article about. It must have been some goofy thing about dating or guys being getting women interested in them and it was something like you know women women like to be shown things so they women like to be taught things excuse me women like to be taught new things and i thought that's such an interesting thing is to single out females that they like to be taught new things don't we all like to be don't we all like to learn new things i think about this all the time i don't know that's actually something that's do you think do you find anything about that statement i don't know uh, no, I mean I'm I still I'm I'm the wor I completely mystified by women <laughs> to this day, and I um, have been obsessed with them since I was like six, and uh, and it took you that long? It took me till six. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was by till I was six, yeah. um, but I but I was uh, yeah I don't I know that. There's a completely different dynamic when you're working with women, which can be fantastic. And, and comedy gets this reputation for being completely sexist, which is, mm. I think, well earned. Mm. And then, uh, over the years, and then I, uh, whenever I've worked with a Tina Fey or an Amy Poehler or a Sarah Silverman, mm. their sex has, you don't even think about it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Right, if right, you're right. thinking about it, right. there's something else at play. Yeah. But when you're yeah. working, there's so many brilliant women comics and writers out there, and it just doesn't come into play. Mm -hmm. You just yeah. admire them. It's like, that's great. They're, they're great, and you want to try and impress them yeah. you know, with, maybe I can be as funny as you. Uh, it's, so, also, it's also a new era that maybe the f first in history, maybe in a way, that men and women can work together in a way that is totally uh, acceptable to accomplish the task at hand. You know, maybe it wasn't a hundred years ago to a man and a woman to be in a room together working on something by themselves would have been, what, you were, what were you doing? You were working alone with this them? This is quite improper. <laughs> yeah, you know, or even taking it all the way back, you know, in some sort of biological way of, you know, the, the, that uh, I wonder what that was like, you know, thousands of years ago. But, um, but you, what you said earlier was it reminded me that it is something. You know, let's say I would work with Loretta Lynn, and, and things would be working and cooking, and beautiful things were happening. And then later on, I was like, you know, she's not only a woman; she's an older woman. You know, you know twice my age, or whatever it is. And uh, why is it working so easily? We come from two different worlds uh, yeah. completely, but for some reason in the room, it's making complete sense. And it's something I've learned a lot about that about just relationships outside of that between me and women. That that. There's a lot to be learned from that, that relationships in a home or, or, or marriage, or they, there's something to be learned from that. We're, we're, you're always working together. Right? Your relationship, you're always working with the other person 
to get somewhere. I think people have an ideal that maybe getting a marriage or getting in a relationship or a marriage is, you know, having a wedding or something, and then and it flat. It stays flat and it stays peaceful for the rest of your life. You find a comfort zone, it stays peaceful, but it's not true. It's constant work again. You have to keep throwing fuel on the fire to keep it alive and keep it, you know. I mean, Albert Einstein said that marriage is an attempt at making something lasting out of an incident. And <laughs> I think he's right. I, I think, you know, all his His wife hated that saying. <laughs> she hated that. Yeah. She's like, it's the, it's, the, it's the crappiest Hallmark card you ever sent me. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what, what? I, know. I always mess it up. Um, yeah, it's, it, 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 you know, this brings up another area, which is just idols. Like you working mm. with a Loretta Lynn or mm. Wanda Jackson, you're working with these people, and it's something I've confronted where I really love it when you forget that they're your idols. And I know yeah, yeah. I, you were nice enough to have me over to your house once and we're sitting on your front porch and mm. you were talking about Bob Dylan, and it felt like you had gotten past the point of, oh my God, it's Bob Dylan. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. In, a, in a good way. You, obviously it's Bob Dylan, but you're not doing that artist a favor. Yeah. When you, when you put someone on that kind of pedestal, you're killing them. When yeah. you put an artist yeah. up there, you're yeah. killing them. It's very and it dangerous felt like, to talk to them and meet them. And yeah, them and I feel like you them. have that ability to, uh, I don't know, you, I mean, I'm, you were telling me, oh, yeah, mm. Bob Dylan wants to do the welding on my fence because yeah, he's into we're, welding now. I and was, yeah. You know, and I was just like, well, that's great. You broke through the, uh, so what was it like to record Tangled Up? And you, like, you broke through sure, that yeah, yeah. and got to, I think I can fix your gate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, well, he, he's a, well, he, and he knows. I mean, he's, you know, I've said it before, I mean, he's like, he's, a, he's a, like my dad. I mean, he, musically, uh, in my own mind, in the heritage that I feel like I jumped in this running river already, I just jumped in, you know, that, you know, he's like, he's like a father to me. So much so that he, uh, I couldn't read his book, his, his autobiography, I couldn't read it. I would, I kept picking it up and I would read 10 pages and I had to put it down. I couldn't, Why? it was just too close. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but it, it just, it was too close to me. I, I couldn't take it. It was like reading a, a letter my own father had written to me, you know, and I'd found it in his closet after he died or something like that. And it, it took me probably like three or four tries before I could actually get through and read the book. It meant too much, all the words, because it was like vi advice with the hand around your shoulder, advice that I knew when I was reading them, it was different for people who are music fans or Dylan fans or other musicians or something like that. It just was totally different for me. And uh, to read those words, they feel like they're, they're directly pointed at me, and I, and I started to get obsessed with the, the fact that people are, are, are misunderstanding the, the style that this is written, and they're misunderstanding the point that's being made in this paragraph. And he does that a lot to me, like anything that he's doing, you know, and it's, 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 it's hard for you to feel like that when you feel like there is, an, there is you know, uh, there is an Albert Einstein alive right now, that Bob Dylan's alive right now, and that, you know, that you, that, that, uh, I can be that close to him and that far apart from him at the same time, simultaneously. You never can, you know, in a lot of ways, get, get super close to somebody like that that you, ne you don't have that much history with, you know? But and you obviously, think, it's not just you, though. Do you think anybody can get that close? I mean, he's a notorious. Well, for to him, to everybody, and even for anybody, for any of your idols, you know, I'm sure like you could maybe have had a conversation with Johnny Carson and learned a lot in 30 seconds, and or even hung out and stayed for a week with him somewhere, and 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 but. How close can you get to, to Johnny Carson? And I, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming that it might be hard to break through that. But but you just take whatever you can get because it's all. Yeah. It's I all. Have, I've I've the several conversations I had with Johnny Carson in my life are embedded in their little yeah. diamonds in my brain. Yeah. And I know I can remember the flashing light on the phone when mm -hmm. they said, "Oh yeah, he's on that line." And, you know, yeah, I remember the yeah, light yeah, flashing yeah. and. Uh, but you're right. Uh, at the same time, I'll be the first to say I knew him. Uh, I didn't know him at all. So, uh, and it's funny because there's someone like, there's someone like Dylan who's constantly, you know, you look at rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And I've had this thought before, which is 
there's only so many chords. There's a few chords. There's a few, and, and you feel like there's got to be a limit to, but people like you can take this, it really is restricted, I mean, in, in a way. You know what I mean? There's not mm -hmm. that many, you can take that palette and keep coming up with new stuff. I've had periods of my life where I've thought, maybe rock and roll is done. Maybe we've done everything with E, yeah. E, A, B7, <laughs> yeah. maybe an occasional yeah. E minor, A minor, you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. maybe we've done it all, but yeah. Bob Dylan, uh, I don't know, every, you just think of the simplicity of it. Mm -hmm. Or Buddy Holly, yeah. someone I really oh, used to get off on because I thought, yeah. oh my God, he really is just using three chords, occasionally a fourth chord, but it's the, yeah. pa it's the pattern it's the that he's putting it down. Yeah, it, it just, it's so simple. And, uh, it, it, he, but he's, it's not, too. Yeah, he's, 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 he's like, he's, he's sideswiping you. You know, he, he's like throwing sand in your face and then coming around from the back and poking, patting you on the back. It's unbelievable what Buddy, Buddy Holly accomplishes it's song by song. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's all people say, oh, it's too bad these people died, you know, and we never got to, you know, they, like, what would they have done if they moved on? But him especially, man, he just, it's something peculiar about him. There's just certain people like Michael Jackson or Buddy Holly or Hank Williams that are just, they're like aliens. They weren't, they weren't really supposed to be here or something, you know. They, how do you born that way? And how do, how do things connect with your brain and come out your fingers? in that way and, and if you catch a glimpse of it, if, you, if, you're, if you're ever part of something that's created that connects with another human being or connects with many human beings, it's a very humbling experience to even think that it's possible, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that you can connect with, you know, if you're going on to your, your show and, and there's how many millions of people watching that or will watch it on the internet or something like that. and that means something, I mean, it means something, and it's, it's inexplainable. You can't explain to it why it works or why it happens. You can, you can try to explain it, but it's really, I hate to, I don't know what other word, but magical or something like that, but words to that effect that, that are, it's, uh, what my point is, when you live inside of it and you create every day, and, and I, I, I want to create every day, that you don't get to know why it works, really. No. You don't really get to know. You see it working and you know it worked, but you don't really get to know why it worked. And I think maybe that's sometimes I'm fascinated with certain science, scientific things, because I think as much as statements are made and papers are printed and reported, uh, we, a lot of science, they'll never know. You know. We don't know why the red spot on Jupiter really is being doing that, that storm, you know, why is it lasting for hundreds of years? We don't really know. We can tell right. you certain aspects about it, but that's pretty uh, compatible to a lot of uh, things you, you like not me. knowing? I like not knowing. It's, it's beautiful. You know what yeah. bummed me out? I, uh, when I was a kid, my brother Neil and I were obsessed with the Titanic. This amazing ship yeah. that like sailed off and then it disappeared and no one ever saw it again. And people survived, some people survived and talked about what happened, but no one had, had conflicting stories and I loved that. Mm. And then they found it. And then they not only found it, but they mapped every quarter of an inch of it. Yeah, yeah. And I remembered thinking, oh. And then they s told you in a computer generated way exactly how it came apart and exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. And I was disappointed because there was something about sailing off into the fog and there's something yeah. about music that I like about, you know, uh, I don't know, the magic of the old blues musician who mm. died young and was poisoned. Yeah. And there's only one, there's two photographs of him in existence mm -hmm. and we don't know much. I don't want to know more than that. I think mm -hmm. there's something beautiful about that. The, the romance of that is, is, is unbelievable and, and you know, a lot of times I find myself whining and complaining about the, the generation that I'm par part of now because it's so much tougher. I mean, if you imagine that something amazing right now was a Leonardo da Vinci existed right now, he would be just inundated with people just trying to exploit him on levels that he would never have been bothered with a few centuries ago. Right. And, and all things that would be detrimental to him, you know, and his genius and all that like that. What about yeah. this too, which is that you had a period of time where you're in Detroit, which is an overlooked city. Mm. No, there's not a lot of media there. Yeah. So you could cook for a while. Yeah. And what I have always said is people ask me my complaint, or not my complaint, because you live in the area you live in, but if the Beatles were around today, mm. 
would be sick of them before they ever got out of the Cavern Club. Right. Yeah. I mean, there'd be a million YouTube yeah. videos. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There'd yeah. be no discovery yeah. on. We had to discover things. That people, you know, it's the. But you can't teach. You can't. You won't. We won't be able to really teach the masses in that way. It's like teaching everyone to recycle or something. Like teaching everybody to to understand the importance of letting something beautiful be. Right. You know, watch a show instead of pulling this up and using proof and using some other thing to your friends to prove something or Twitter it or whatever it is. Right. Like, can something beautiful just be like that? And that's that's the danger of where we are right now and where we're headed. It's it's. I hate to be, always be thinking about that, but it, when you do, when you when you consume, when you're sitting there and you're entertained or you're enjoying art and music and books and films. You can have different opinion. When you're inside of it and you want to make it exist and you're trying to help it exist and be an antenna and make this thing, stuff come out, um, you're more concerned with the fact that the way people are getting it, the mediums and formats from which they're getting it, is diluting the romance of it. Right. You know, and uh, it's an exhausting battle to fight off that nowadays. Well, there's too much data. Yeah. We have too there much. There is. You know, a band like uh, Stooges in the 1970 would have right. had three photographs of them right. taken. Right. And now there's thousands of every band out there or musician out there. Thousands right. of photos. You know, you didn't I didn't nobody knew where the Stooges lived or where what they were did all day long or anything like that. And or you know and now for sure Robert Johnson nobody knew what he was doing. But you know what? That's uh, that's where you get myth. Yeah. <laughs> the but, thing that fuels myth is lack of information. <laughs> uh, I have a question here. Kelly Moraz from Facebook asked what kind of music do your kids listen to you? Do you try to influence their musical taste? <laughs> I, I don't. I uh, I don't ever force stuff on them. I just I, I at times expose them to things, and sometimes they don't like it, and sometimes they do. And uh, I'm always shocked at the things they like. That you know, my daughter likes Charlie Chaplin so much. It's just That's shocking great. to me. Uh, they had heard some Beatles songs and started liking them. And uh, I was driving from Detroit to Nashville a few weeks ago, and. I said, well, listen to this record, and it was Sgt. Pepper, and I put it on in, on the car, and I handed them whatever it was, the, and they could see the album cover, and, uh, you know, they just looked at it so much, and they had so many questions about the album cover, and it was so beautiful to just be on this drive and to think about Sgt. Pepper again, which I don't, haven't thought about in whatever, since I was a teenager, and uh, to talk about all the faces on there, how that was made, why they were making it. When kids ask you those questions, you get to relive those moments, which is really beautiful, you know, and uh, so... Uh, they, yeah, they, they listen to uh, lots of things like that. The Ramones, uh, the Beatles. Oh, that's great. They uh, listen to the Ramones. Yeah, they, they like that. And uh, um, But they also like, which I like even more importantly, is novelty songs. I like things like Crazy Frog and those kind <laughs> of songs because I think, you know, like our Monster Mash, th those, those tracks are really culturally important. Yeah, yeah. You Monster know. Mash is you know. fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and if a kid likes it, it's a good, it's... It's they a cut hit. through. They're, they they're not lying. Yeah, they not know. Lying. Um, I wish we could talk for about four more years. <laughs> I think that would be detrimental to both our careers. So uh, <laughs> uh, I got to end it. Thanks, um, for, thanks for talking to me like this. This is uh, a breath of, breath this of is, fresh air. This has been uh, fantastic. I mean, I've oh. thoroughly enjoyed every second of our chat, and the drinking helped. Um, <laughs> That'll do it for this episode of Serious Jibber Jabber. Um, to say I thank Jack White would be the understatement of the century. Uh, you've always been such a good friend to me, and such oh, a and so, but such likewise. a pure spirit too. And oh, so likewise, I likewise. really appreciate that. Congratulations on all your uh, success. Um, I'd wish you happiness, but I know that's detrimental to your art, so I won't. <laughs> to see all the other episodes of Serious Jibber Jabber, go to teamcoco.com. Slash serious. Or go to Conan's house and he'll reenact them for I you. Will, you're all invited to my home mm. and I will reenact these <laughs> with little cutouts on popsicle sticks <laughs> for $20 a pop. If you ever need so me to do, do a soundtrack for any of that stuff, just let me know. Really? Yeah. Oh, so will you, you really upholster my stuff? furniture? Yes. You heard it here. You look into that, that camera, not looking at this one. Huh? Ah. There's nothing shiftier than guys looking at different cameras. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>